Okay, so today we're going to use our, our, our formalism that involved Fourier transforms and actually talk about diffraction problems. And I set up the general recipe last time. And, uh, and the basic idea is that you, first of all, so, so what, is the, what is the setup? So imagine you have um, a laser. So, so the thing we're going to do in lab, you have the laser shining, shining on a hole of a very specific size. So this is all opaque. And there's a hole there. And if you spread the laser out appropriately, it, you basically have a plane wave hitting this hole. And, and so at the, when the laser hits the hole at z equals 0, uh, the electric field is known. It's, it's uniform in this, within the circle and 0 everywhere else. And this is sort of the, the very simplest setup we can have. And it's, it's what we're going to sort of calculate all the way through. You can imagine other interesting masks here. You can have um, you know, letters or other shapes or other patterns instead of just a, a hole. So basically, the mask here is, is one. It allows light through in the center. And it's 0. It blocks all light around the edges. And uh, But you can imagine any mask you want. And the electric field hits it, and it imposes um, some amplitude and some phase on that electric field. And, and you could have masks that are pure amplitude masks, like this one, or you could have masks that are pure phase masks. If you look through them, they're, they're perfectly clear, and they're just slightly different thicknesses of glass, and they just uh, impose a different phase on the electric field as it hits the, hits the uh, mask at, at z equals 0. And the question is, what happens after this as, as the light propagates? And in this case, as the light propagates, you get a sort of bullseye pattern where a lot of light is concentrated in the center, and then you get rings of successively dimmer and dimmer uh, light going going further and further out. And and today we'll, well, maybe to the, some combination of today and maybe next time we'll we'll finish working this out. So so what is the idea? Uh, the idea of, of how to work this out is to to write the electric field that hits this this mask as a superposition of plane waves. And because the, the electric field is sort of constant, in, at least for this example, is constant and uniform in the, in the aperture and zero outside, um, there isn't just a single plane wave, right? Even though maybe the light coming in is a single plane wave, the light going out cannot be a single plane wave because you cannot make um, a finite circle of light out of uh, a, a single plane wave. So in order to construct the electric field at the aperture, it actually needs to be a sum of plane waves where within this circle, they add up constructively and uniformly. And outside of this circle, they add up destructively and end up giving you 0. And, and the method of doing that, to ask what, what is the amplitude of each of the possible plane waves that's going off in every possible direction, uh, the method of doing that is, is a Fourier transform. So writing the electric field as a function of, of x and y as a super, superposition of plane waves, that procedure is, is taking the Fourier transform. And then we know what happens to each of these modes. Uh, each of these modes is just a plane wave. We know the solution to plane, wave, uh, plane waves. And all that happens to each mode is it picks up an extra factor. So if it starts off as uh, Starts off as some e uh, e tilde of kx and ky, and that is the the weight that is applied to the plane wave that's going in the kx direction, and and the the actual electric field is a whole sum of these over all possible kx's and ky's. Those are those are uh, uh, ripples in the xy plane. We know what happens as we propagate that forward in z. All it does is it picks up an e to the i kz z, where k squared is a constant, kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. And um, this is just given by, let me get the units right here, so omega squared over c squared, I believe. Uh, yeah. So. So for a particular color of light, a particular omega or a particular wavelength, you, know, you could also write this as 2 pi over lambda squared. 
um, the, the total k vector is constant. And so the kz component, the z component, the component that's going straight out, now depends on the x and y components, sort of what's left over after you take into account the little bit of x and little bit of y direction. And that's all that happens. Every, every component that you've decomposed it into gets this extra phase factor as a function of z. And, and that's how you can propagate things forward in z. And then to actually get the position space representation of this at a, at a particular z, you just have to add up all the plane waves. So d uh, dkx over 2 pi integral d ky over 2 pi. This will give you uh, what you want, which is the electric field um, in position space. So no tilde as a function of x, y, and z, where, where this is the the plane wave decomposition, the amplitudes of all the plane waves at z equals zero. Uh, so this is really like a, a 2D, 2D Fourier transform of the, of the initial wave. It's just whatever coefficients you need to make up the wave that hits at, at, uh, at zero. Uh, okay. And, and, then, and then the idea is that uh, you, know, you could solve for kz here. kz, this thing in the exponent is just the, just the square root of this constant that has to do with the wavelength, minus kx squared minus ky squared. And, uh, and you can, can, uh, can solve it from there. But um, this, this is a very general procedure, but it doesn't, it's a little bit abstract and doesn't help us uh, work out specific problems. And so going back and forth between position space and k space, momentum space, is uh, is not all that intuitive. So, so today we're going to push this forward a little bit more and actually uh, work out what what we're going to first sort of keep it um, keep it general, and then we'll eventually make some approximations that are quite common in the world of diffraction. Like you're you're quite far away from the thing that that's causing the diffraction. So approximations like that. All right. So let me let me. Uh, write this same equation just in slightly different language. And we're going to uh, process this into something that looks maybe a little bit more familiar from E79 or, or STEMS classes or other kind of signal processing -y math classes or uh, uh, what is the physics 115, maybe the sort of complex, complex class uh, or math 115. So, the um, the I don't want to say this. So this this electric field, the thing we want in the end here, it its Fourier transform is its two D Fourier transform is whatever multiplies this. Uh, this complex exponent here. So, so the 2D Fourier transform of the thing we want, so Fourier transform 2D of E, well, we're always dealing with the complex field E plus of X, Y, and Z. 2D Fourier transform of that thing equals what? Well, it's, it's whatever multiplies this uh, coefficient inside of this integral. So it is it is the 2D Fourier transform of the field at z equals zero. So E plus of x, y, z equals zero. That's this first term. That's, that's this term. That's uh, this whole thing is E, E tilde. And ta times this extra phase factor. So times E to the i and I'll, I'll just write it out for once. So square root of k squared minus kx squared minus ky squared uh, z. So z, we're not taking a 3D Fourier transform. So z is never, uh, never, never getting turned into plane waves. Z is always just a parameter that determines how far away we put our screen to see, a, to see the pattern. 
Okay. So, so there's something there's something called the Fourier convolution theorem, where maybe you remember this from stems or from some other. I'll, I'll actually spend some time sort of reviewing it and proving it today, which which says that if I can write this thing as the Fourier transform of something, so if I can write this as the 2D Fourier transform of some function that I'm going to call G, G of X, Y, and Z, then what I have is I have a Fourier transform of what I want is the product of the Fourier transform of something and something else. And the convolution theorem says that if I have a product of things in Fourier space, it is the convolution of those things in regular space. So the Fourier transform of this is the product of the Fourier transform of that and the Fourier transform of G. And what that means in, in position space is that the thing I want, E of X, Y, Z, is the convolution of E of X, Y, and Z with zero with whatever this G function is. And we'll spend a bunch of time working out this function G. So that's, that's a matter of inverse Fourier transforming this, which looks ugly, but uh, it will become simple with some, some approximations that we make. So, so that's, that's sort of the outline for, for what we're gonna do today, which is if we don't wanna deal with any of this Fourier transform stuff, if we just wanna work purely in position space, we can do it with this setup because we have, we have this product here in the form of a, uh, uh, in, in the, well, we, we have this product and we can invoke the Fourier convolution theorem. And all we need to do is just once and for all compute what the Fourier transform of this thing is, since this doesn't depend on the initial, uh, the initial light that we're, that we're using. This just depends on the properties of the propagation. And in signal processing class, this, this kind of thinking goes under the name of impulse response. This function g, we'll see why that is in a little bit. Um, and in physics, it tends to go under the name of a Green's function. It's the, so the impulse, the response to your system of an impulse, and in the optics case, an impulse would just be a, a point source of light. What, what does that look like far away? Um, the physicists tend to call that a Green's function. So let me, uh, let me erase this. So I, I will, we'll get back to the actual diffraction problem that we care about, but let me spend a little bit of time reviewing this Fourier convolution theorem because it's something that you may have seen or you may have seen the Laplace, the Laplace transform version of that in stems, but it's, uh, it's not that hard once you sort of lay down what the definition of the Fourier transform is and what the definition of convolution is, um, the, the things follow, follow from each other. So let me, let me just state the, the theorem. So the convolution theorem is that if, if you have some H and it is the convolution of two functions, F convolved with G, and I'll write what that means in a second, then there's sort of a double implication here. And the Fourier transform of H is the Fourier transform of F times just regular, regular multiplication times G. Or we can write this in, in this sort of, this notation here, the Fourier transform of H is the Fourier transform of F times Fourier transform of G. All right, so let's, um, let's write what we mean by Fourier transforms and what we mean by convolutions. And we'll see, we'll see how this works. So I'm gonna, I'll prove this and I'll prove it just in one dimension. Um, and the generalization to two dimensions, which is what we need here is, is pretty straightforward. It's just, uh, I just have to write half as much stuff to, to show you what it means in one dimension. So, so let me just write, uh, let me start with the definition of the Fourier transform. So we've, we've seen this before. If we, we were to write F of X as a sum of uh, 
some of the plane waves, e to the i kx x. Each weighted by, so here's the sum of plane waves, each weighted by some coefficient, which we'll call f tilde of kx. But normally you see this in time, right? Just some function of time is e to the i omega t times the, the, the frequency spectrum, a function of omega. Here I'm just writing it as kx to make it easy to generalize. Um, and we call this the inverse Fourier transform or the synthesis where we're synthesizing a function out of a bunch of plane waves. And we could do the opposite. We could write what is the, what is the frequency spectrum in terms of the position. This is a forward transform here. So dx f of x e to the minus i kx x. So the difference here is the minus and the factor of two pi because k is really two pi times the real honest to God frequency. All right, so, so these are our, our, uh, our kind of our definition of the tildes here. So this applies to F and to G and to H all separately. And let me remind you what the convolution is. So uh, convolution, so this is what we start here with here. So kind of in more detail, H as a function of X is this new function f convolved with g as a function of x. And uh, maybe you remember from, from engineering class, what does this mean? This means you take you take f, the, uh, there's two versions of this. Let me just make sure I get the right one. So let's take f at some x prime and you take g of x minus x prime and you multiply them together. So what you're doing is you're, you're flipping and shifting G and you're sliding G in all possible configurations and you're, you're multiplying to F and then you're, you're adding up, uh, you're adding up the, the product. So DX goes from minus infinity to infinity. So if you have a square wave convolved with another square wave, as you slide them together, uh, you'll get zero for a while because uh, they multiply and they don't get anything. And then when they first just start to touch, so when X is, uh, is uh, uh, gets small enough so that the, the shifting uh, just starts to touch, then they'll, they'll start to increase, increase, increase. When they're right on top of each other, so right at X equals zero, when the offset is zero, uh, there's a maximum overlap. So you're multiplying a square by a square and you get maximum overlap. So that's a, a peak. And then as you slide more and more and more and more, uh, the peak goes down. So, so maybe just in for signals, a square wave convolved with a square wave, this is a triangle. Because you're taking a square wave, the two square waves and flipping one, although here it's symmetric, flipping one and sliding, sliding across and uh, adding the products. So, so this is the definition of convolution. Um, it's this flipping and sliding and adding operation. Now, let's let's prove that that this is the case. If if H is the convolution of these two things, then the product uh, product of the Fourier transforms is the Fourier transform of the first thing, and that will help us solve some of these diffraction problems. So. That is a pretty straightforward of just pretty straight straightforward application of just right using these definitions here. So my h of x on this side, I'm going to write it in this form here. So this is integral from minus infinity to infinity dkx over two pi. Here I have h tilde of k of x e to the i dx x. So this equals this. So I'm going to write minus infinity to infinity dx. And now I'm going to write f of x prime as integral from minus infinity to infinity uh, dkx prime over 2 pi. I'm just going to use the Fourier definition here. I just have to keep track of my primes here. So this is f tilde kx prime 
e to the i kx prime x prime, okay? And now I have g, which I'm also gonna write as a, as a Fourier transform. Hopefully I don't run out of room here. Uh, so same, same form here. Um, uh, you know what, maybe I'll, I'll just go to the next slide because I know I'm gonna run out of room. And because the video is not as good today. Okay, so it's this times this minus infinity, infinity. So this is a whole, a whole new sum here. So if I'm gonna wanna deal with cross terms and everything, I have to give this, this uh, integration variable a whole new name. So I'm gonna call this d kx double prime over two pi. All right, so, so it's g, g tilde of f kx double prime. And um, where does this x minus x prime go? Well, the only place x went was up here. So this is e to the i kx double prime. Instead of x, I have x minus x prime. Okay, yeah, I definitely was gonna run out of room. Okay, so uh, this is what I'm starting with. I'm starting with that H is the convolution of F and G. I'm writing all these things out. And now there's sort of two, two more steps and we're done. Um, the first step is to uh, kind of wanna, kind of wanna keep everything, but there's no way I can keep everything. All right, let me just erase part of what I'm trying to prove. So this is what I'm trying to prove. I'm trying to prove that the, the tildes are products of each other. All right, so I have three giant sums. I have a giant sum over X. I have a giant sum over K prime and a giant sum over K double prime. Let me rearrange these things to, to move the, the dx, uh, this should be dx prime. Sorry, let me rearrange these things to move the, this integral all the way in. So I'll move the, the k type integrals out. So this becomes integral minus infinity to infinity, dkx over two pi, sorry, dkx prime over two pi minus infinity to infinity, dkx double prime over two pi. So these are these two integrals. Now you can see where we're, we're starting to get a product here. So this is f tilde of kx prime, g tilde of kx double prime. So that's these two. So that's everything that doesn't depend on, on uh, dx prime. And in fact, uh, since my integral is over, over uh, x prime, I have one more piece that doesn't depend on x prime, which is e to the i kx double prime x. And now all of this gets multiplied by what's left over. So minus infinity to infinity dx prime. And now the things that do depend on dx prime, it is this and that. So e to the i, uh, K, ah, okay, good. Kx prime, that's positive here. And Kx double prime comes with a minus x prime here. So this is minus Kx double prime, x prime. All right, so that, that is it. Now things start to simplify. So remember I, I asked last time, what is this integral? An integral over all of x of e to the i something x. And the answer was, does anyone remember? Delta function? Delta function, yeah, two, specifically two pi times the delta function. Delta function of kx prime, that's kx double prime. And with this delta function, so the two pi is gonna cancel this two pi and the delta function, we can do the, the k prime integral. So let me just write the answer here. So that makes, I guess this was the, I said, you just need the definitions. You need the definitions plus this one integral here. So we still have our first integral, minus infinity, k 
infinity d uh, dkx prime over 2 pi. So this 2 pi has gone away. This integral has gone away. I have f tilde of k prime, x prime. I have g tilde now also of kx prime because the delta function and e to the i kx prime x. And that's it. And what is this? Well, this, this says that the Fourier transform of H, right? That's what this is, the Fourier transform of H, H tilde equals the product of these two uh, Fourier transforms, F tilde and G tilde. And uh, now that I've, you have to, uh, well, there's a little bit of a subtlety here. So this, this left-hand side is a sum, right? And this right-hand side is also a sum over, over dkx prime. And it's not always legal to say, well, if I have a sum of things over here and a sum of things over here, they're equal term by term. But because these exponentials form a complete orthonormal basis, we can say that each of these, each of these terms is uh, linearly independent of, of all the other terms. So in quantum mechanics class, you can imagine taking this whole equation and taking the inner product with some bra. You could do a similar thing with functions here to prove that the sum of orthonormal functions weighted by something equals the sum of the same set of orthonormal functions weighted by something that, that the weights have to be equivalent. So this says that H tilde of kx has to be equal to term by term f tilde of kx, g tilde of kx. So, um, okay, so that's, that's the, the one dimensional convolution theorem. And the two dimensional convolution theorem is all the same things. It's just, I have, I have one of these for x and one of these for y, and I'll get one of these delta functions for kx and one of these delta functions for ky. And then uh, I have a two dimensional orthonormal basis of, of e to the i kxx, e to the i kyy. So that's sort of the, the lightning generalization to, to any number of dimensions. But this is the convolution theorem. So this kind of complicated convolution operation is related to the, the product term by term in the, in the other space. Uh, so now let's, let's use this to write what we actually want uh, in terms of things that we can calculate. So let me, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep this here. I'm gonna erase everything else because I think I wanna reuse most of this board. So I, maybe while I'm erasing, did, did, did you talk about this in any other class, the sort of Fourier convolution theorem or Laplace transform convolution theorem? Is this something that has come up in your mud lives? At least for those of you who are mud students. Certainly was in the old stems. I don't know about the new stems. I guess not. Uh oh. Oh, okay. And this wasn't a review, it was a lightning introduction. All right, so let me write what we what I uh, what I had before, which was that uh, the Fourier transform. Uh, let me use a different marker. The 2D Fourier transform of what we want, E of X y and at some arbitrary z was the 2D Fourier transform of what we start with. So e plus just of x, y, and z equals zero times this function, this phase factor e to the i times the square root of stuff times z. And I'll, I'll write out what that stuff is in a second. And what we want to do is we want to write this as, this is h, h tilde, 
and this this piece here is going to be f tilde, and we want to write this as g tilde. And what we want to find is is actually g. So let me just write out in more detail here. So g g tilde is e to the i times the square root of k squared. That's just the has to do with the wavelength of the light you're using, minus kx squared is ky squared z. Let's just be very explicit here. This is g tilde of kx, ky, and z. So we're not for transforming z. Z is just a parameter. And what we want is we want g not tilde of k uh, of x, y. And z. So this is the the inverse Fourier transform of this, and and that's just my uh, infinity infinity kx two pi minus infinity infinity dky over two pi. The the thing that we have here e to the i times the square root of this constant minus thing we're integrating over my squared minus the other thing we're integrating over squared z times e to the plus i kxx plus i ky y. All right, so this, maybe I'll put it in parentheses, this thing in parentheses is g tilde. And to get g, we integrate over all possible kx's and ky's weight as weights of these plane waves. Okay, so here, unfortunately, there is no closed form solution to this integral. If there were, then we could write everything in, in position space as just a convolution. Um, and now, historically, in, in diffraction math, you know, back in, back in France, uh, Fresnel was the first to really sort of formalize it in this way. And he realized that if you made approximations, you could, you could actually do this integral and get some, some pretty nice uh, expressions. So I think we can do the, the, first, the first version of this. So that we'll make two approximations. One is the Fresnel approximation, and then we will further approximate it uh, with what's, uh, what's called the Fraunhofer approximation. So Fresnel uh, was, the, was the first to, uh, to do this first step. So let's say approximation number one, approximation number one for null diffraction. So what is this approximation? Well, the, the idea is that if you have a screen and you're shining a, a laser at it and you have a hole here um, and you have a hole in your, uh, an aperture that the laser is hitting and you have a screen way over here at some distance Z away, as long as your hole isn't too tiny and as long as you're hitting it with a plane wave, most of the light goes pretty straightforward. So there's sort of light that comes off at some, some different angles. Let's, let's call this Y. And you can imagine X is going into the screen. Um, and the approximation that, that's going to be made is that the, we're only going to worry about angles that are small. So let's just say that this, this angle here, theta Y, is, is a small angle. So most of the light goes pretty straight, straight forward. Um, and that's true for all the settings that we, that we consider in the lab. So maybe we're two meters away from the hole and the whole size of the, the pattern that we can see is only a few centimeters big. So that's a, that's a pretty good approximation. That's good to 1% you know, or so. And how does that help us simplify things? Well, if we think about rays that come off at different angles, those correspond to different k vectors. So if you have a k vector that's going off at some angle like that, there's the z component of the k vector 
and the y component of the k vector or the x component going into the board. And uh, you can write theta theta y in this case. This is pretty close, well, pretty close to ky over k. Right? The, the k component, uh, as, as long as theta is small, uh, this is pretty close to uh, k, the y component over k. And the approximation is that this is much, much less than one. This is sort of a normal small angle approximation. And uh, we will write this. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to write this square root uh, using this small angle approximation. So that's that's a Fresnel Fresnel approximation. It's just this regular small angle approximation. Uh, most of the light goes forward, and uh, we're only considering, uh, the, you know, asking the question about light that that's going mostly forward. So so let's. Let's see what happens there. Let me let me get rid of uh, this. Maybe I have to erase one of the one things. I've got only a few minutes left. Let me let me finish the Fresnel approximation. It's pretty fast. Uh, it's just saying that the square root of k squared minus kx squared minus ky squared. You know, our, whenever we make approximations, they're always dimensionless. So you always have to get something in a dimensionless form. So in order to do that, we'll, we'll factor out a, a k here. This is 1 minus something small. So kx squared over k squared minus ky squared over k squared. And we're only considering small kx's and ky's. So the approximation is this. This is approximately equal to k times the normal binomial thing. One minus a half of all this stuff. A half kx squared over k squared minus a half, uh, oops, ky squared over k squared. So, you know, one of the most common approximations here in physics. Um, all right, so now if we were to plug that in, in these parentheses here, um, what we get is, um, so plugging this approximation in, let me just write this here. This is gonna give us, uh, well, it'll be a little tight integral from minus infinity to infinity. Oh, let me, oh, let me write it down here because I'm gonna need more room. So if you can get rid of this ugly square root, the integrals become much more doable. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take, take this z factor. So, so this is the, the first term is just k here, right? So if I write the square root as k minus stuff, the first term just multiplies z. So I can take that out. So this is going to be e to the i kz times now, because this square root breaks up into a sum of two terms, I can actually write, I can break it up into an integral over kx and an integral over ky, because they're no longer intimately linked because of this uh, square root here. So here is a minus infinity to infinity dkx over 2 pi. Um, and now I'll write everything that depends on kx. So there's this term here. There's e to the i kx x. And there's a term from the square root here. So minus a half, uh, well, everything in the numerator is kx squared and z here. Everything in the denominator is, uh, oh, there's still an i here, over 2k, or 2k. And there, there's a similar thing in the, in the y direction. So minus infinity to infinity, dKy over 2 pi e to the i ky y minus i ky squared z over 2k. All right, so maybe you recognize these integrals from StatMech or from quantum. Uh, we do a lot of these kind of integrals. These are just 
Gaussian type integrals. They're complex Gaussian, but they're still Gaussian type integrals. So it's e to the ax squared plus bx plus c, right? Where a is the coefficient of this kx squared term, b is the coefficient of this kx term, and c is, is zero here. There's no, there's no constant term. I guess we've already taken out a constant term. Um, and so you can, uh, given that these are just Gaussian integrals, you can look up in the, in the back of Townsend's textbook, for example, I think it's Appendix D, so I've taught quantum many, many times. Uh, you can look up how to, how to do these Gaussian integrals and what the answer is. And if you do that, then, then what you get is that you just get that this G, G of X, Y, Z turns into something pretty simple. So G of X, Y, Z turns into just some constant K over two pi I Z times a Gaussian E to the I K over two Z uh, X squared plus Y squared. And then this I K Z is still hanging around here plus I K Z. All right, and now uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the first approximation. And we can use this to write this the Fourier transform of the thing we want is the Fourier transform of the thing we get from initial conditions times the Fourier transform of this G of X. So this thing here is gonna be Fourier transform of G. And given that the Fourier transforms multiply the original functions must be uh, related by convolution. So let me just write that last, that last one last result, and then we are uh, we're done with this piece. Um, uh, depending on how much time I have next time, I may do I may do a, uh, an example. You know, even the simplest examples of actually plugging in numbers are not are not that easy. Uh, or I may just march on and make our second approximation, which is kind of a even more extreme version of this small angle approximation. Small angles plus small apertures. All right, so, so we have, uh, let's, let's invoke our convolution theorem here, which said that uh, H, if H tilde equals F tilde times G tilde, then H, was f convolved with g. We have our h, we have our f, and we have our g now. And so, uh, so I can write e plus of x, y, z, the thing we want, the electric field at some random place, is gonna be the convolution of the thing we start with and our g, which I just wrote here. So let me write that the convolution is minus infinity to infinity dx prime, it's the two-dimensional convolution now minus infinity to infinity dy prime of the thing we have at the origin, e plus of x prime, y prime, and zero, z equals zero, with g. So g of x minus x prime, y minus y prime, and z. Okay, and and that that is our that's how to how to compute what the field looks like at any z based on what the field looks like at zero, and this Green's function, this this propagator. So, uh, ten more seconds. Why why is this Green function called the impulse response? Well, if you start out with a delta function as a source here, if you if you make your hole so tiny that uh, that you basically have a, a point source, then this integral just picks out x prime and y prime equals zero. And then your final, your final electric field really is just g here. And so this is, uh, this Green's function uh, is just the impulse response. It's, it's the response of the system to a, a single delta function source. That's, that's what you get if you plugged in a delta function here. You would get that this is, is the thing. And notice that it, it's sort of a bunch of phases, but it, 
it falls off as one over Z, which means it falls off, the intensity falls off as one over R as you go farther away. All right, so sorry, I've got to run. Uh, sorry, the video quality wasn't that great. I was a little bit rushed. But I will see you all on Wednesday for what is kind of the final mathy lecture, and then we might have a more fun lecture on quantum stuff on Friday.